Well, thank you very much, and um, I am honored to be here. And, and Tom, somewhere in the middle of your speech, I was thinking and reflecting that you know, I finally understood my role this morning. I'm supposed to be the therapist. <laughs> I am uh, honored and excited to be here um, for many reasons, uh, not least the fact that, in all honesty, this is the first time since I was in Davos 2020 that I am at an event with more than 20 people and everyone is three-dimensional. I just love that. <laughs> Very nice to see you. And also because this topic of transformation is one that is very close to my heart. I would argue I've spent most of my career on exactly that, transforming large, typically large organizations, um, and digital has been the key driver of that. So I'll share some of my experience, and I could not imagine a better moment to discuss transformation. I mean, we just went through two years of COVID with all the lockdowns and the creativity to try and find ways to still make business and actually improve businesses. And we did things in weeks that used to take months or years. So there's something good about taking that with us into the future. And now, as a European, I am, of course, deeply concerned that we have a war going on in Europe. And so there is something going on in this world that needs our attention. And it will drive transformation, whether we like it or not, not just of our companies, but our societies, our countries, and the world. Now, in my mind, this is a leadership moment, and, and therefore this is super important that we begin to master transformation at a different pace than what Tom was talking about, and hopefully without the therapist. And, and I believe that all of this didn't start with COVID. In my world, it started in 1989. I remember that. I graduated that year, and I got a job at SAP, and I moved to Germany. And in 18, uh, sorry, 1989, that was the, the year when the Berlin Wall fell. I didn't expect that to happen. It was a surprise. I think most people didn't expect that to happen. But that event changed globalization. It's almost like the world got twice as big and we could globalize in all countries of the world, not just the part of the world that was kind of on our political point of view. And I think that drove a lot of opportunities for me personally, growth opportunities for companies and, of course, transformation. But it wasn't the only event that happened that year. That same year in Geneva at CERN, researchers figured out a protocol to put on top of the internet, the HTTP, and with that, the World Wide Web was created. Not intended to be what it is today, but that, while globalization kind of doubled the world, suddenly the world got super connected. We could connect with anyone all over the world, people to people, companies to companies. Friedman talked about, you know, the world is getting flat, so you have this massive growth opportunity and you can connect to anyone in real time. What an opportunity. And it's been driving my career, my entire career, based on those two things. Now, that same year was the first year that there was a, um, a G8 political leader standing up in front of the United Nations at the General Assembly and talking about climate as a problem. Margaret Thatcher gave a speech at the United Nations General Assembly that year and talked about the urgency of climate action. I revisited that video, it's on YouTube, this last week, and it is super relevant even today. Only the urgency has gone up quite dramatically. Now, each one of these events, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the invention of the World Wide Web, and climate as a problem are significant events individually. And when you combine them, you get a dramatic inflection point, a moment to transform, because from that moment on, everything changes. All the rules, all the success factors that we had until that moment will suddenly no longer be valid. I call that an inflection point, a moment when the rules of the game change so dramatically that continuous improvement is no longer sufficient to stay relevant. And because of that, many of the companies that did not realize that Tom talked about that. Some of these you know, S&P 500 companies, they began to disappear at rapid pace. And suddenly there was this new world that arised with new rules of the game. At the World Economic Forum, uh, Klaus Schwab calls it the fourth industrial revolution. And I've been arguing against that term because it sounds like it's the fourth version of something we already done three times before, just a little bit more with more technology. I'm arguing it's not. 
it's dramatically different. The first three industrial revolutions were all about adding technology to create more scale, more economy of scale so that we can have you know, marginal costs go down. We were mass producing at scale. We moved our labor to China to get the cost down. And the winners in that phase, in all of the three phases, 200 years of industrialization were the companies that got big because with size comes competitive edge in a world where it's all about scale. And suddenly, after 19, uh, sorry, 1989, scale, size, no matter, is giving you competitive edge. It's about speed. Because in the digital world, it's all about speed. It's speed because you have network effects, and whoever gets there first gets the gravity of the network, and with that comes a competitive edge, which is not just scale. It is speed. And so suddenly, the companies that survive this phase are the companies that are innovative, that innovate faster than other companies, that apply digital you know, transformation faster than any other companies. And those that don't, they really get a hard time keeping up. Look at the companies that have not disappeared but didn't really make it. I mean, these were winners in their categories. And suddenly, they get challenged because they're just too slow. And interestingly enough, if you look at the companies that figure out the new rules of the game, the digital rules of the game. These are new companies. They were not around when I graduated in 1989. They didn't exist. We didn't know their names. And they are now the winners. That is interesting. And it indicates that we are living at an inflection point where it is dramatically different. And if we don't change the way we do things, we will continue down that curve and we'll just become better and better at becoming irrelevant. And we need to find a way to the upper curve fast enough to stay relevant and lead the transformation, not be a victim of it. Now, Clayton Christensen argues that this is really hard. He calls it the innovator's dilemma. You probably read the book. It's a beautiful book. But there's a problem with the conclusion. It's like, if you are very successful, you are doomed to fail. <laughs> That's not a nice conclusion, in particular not you know, as a chairman of very large companies. I fail to accept that as a rule. So I studied this long and hard. And I found two solutions to the problem. The first solution and the easiest solution is never be successful. <laughs> you don't have the problem, and you'll be happy. Now, if you don't like that solution, then you need to find ways to reinvent your company when your company as, is at its top, not when it's failing. That's what we need to figure out to do. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Now, why is this so hard? I have found three reasons, three challenges that we need to overcome as large, successful companies in order to be able to reinvent ourselves. The first one is that we have wrong assumptions. Now, assumptions have a problem that we don't necessarily know which assumptions we have. It's just something that's built into the DNA of the organization. And it is based on the fact that we got successful. And because of the success, that's just the way we do things around here. Or we don't do things like that around here. And therefore, we fail to see the obvious. This is a great example of that. Some of you have probably seen this uh, airplane, the Solar Impulse. I had the pleasure of meeting Bertrand Picard, one of the co-founders of this. I mean, this is a fantastic entrepreneur. He just had big dreams about things that seem completely impossible. And then he makes it happen. And, and this is one of those examples. So he built a plane. He wanted to prove that there's enough energy coming from the sun. You can even fly around the world just using the energy from the sun. And I asked him, what was your biggest challenge? And he said it was an engineering challenge to build a plane this size. Because it has to be a pretty big. You have all these solar panels. They have to be enough solar panels to actually fuel the electricity on board this plane. So the plane is pretty big. Actually, it has a wingspan the size of an Airbus 380. But then you need a lot of technology on the plane. And therefore, you need weight capacity for that. So the plane itself can only weigh 10% of what a plane normally of this size would weigh. Otherwise, you don't have enough weight capacity for the technology. And so he went to the best engineers in the aviation industry and asked them to find a way to build a plane this size with that weight. And they all said, with no exception, that is impossible. So I looked at him and said, well, I saw the plane. We just went to it. 
you know, how did you do it? And he said, well, I went to the engineers in the yacht industry, those that build these, you know, competitive sailboats, because they didn't know it was impossible. See, that is the essence of a wrong assumption. And if you don't challenge that, you will not embark on the journey in a successful way because you assume it's not possible. So that's one thing we need to overcome. The next one is that we have wrong plans. And I can assure you I have made wrong plans many, many times in my professional career because I tend to do what everyone does. It's like the incremental improvement of last year's plan. Now that works fine in a linear, predictable future. But what is happening when we get to digital is these exponential curves where it looks like nothing at the beginning and it's really hard to differ between an exponential curve the first two years and just a flat line that never gets anywhere. And you kind of got to believe on that. I have been many times in my boardrooms been, you know, rejecting plans that look like the blue one. We call them hockey stick plans, you know, go home and improve your plans so we get better at this. But see, that is what is going on in the digital world. You don't necessarily have that plan, but you constantly challenge yourself so that you get an exponential development. Now, I could have plotted the share price of two very successful companies, and it would look exactly like this, Walmart and Amazon. In 2008, Walmart had a market cap of $210 billion, one of the best, most successful retailers on this planet. That same year, Amazon was 20 billion, so 10%. Now, Amazon followed that blue line, and what happened? Fast forward, 2021. At the end of 2021, Walmart had an impressive market cap of 410 billion, so almost doubled. Yet at that time, Amazon was at 1.6 trillion, four times more valuable than Walmart. And it's not that Walmart didn't do a good job. They just didn't get to the exponential curve. And that is the difference from the industrial point of view and the digital point of view. We got to find that. And don't forget to do that. Speed matters. Because if you get behind that curve, the gap between where you need to be and where you are suddenly becomes too big for you to ever catch up. Now, the last problem we have I created some of that, I have to admit, Tom. It is the IT landscapes that we have. I can assure you this was not intended to be like that. It started with transactional systems. I started at SAP in 1990, and we did ERP systems, and we had this idea that we'll put everything a company needs into one system, one big integrated system. Great idea. But then reality came along. <laughs> it's really annoying, you know, when that happens because, you know, we were doing great with R3 and this was a winning product and, and suddenly there was this company called Siebel Systems and they had created another category called CRM. And we were looking at that and said, well, we, why, why would you have another system? We have ERP, it's fine with ERP. And we figured out, no, CRM is different. It's not about a transactional system. This is about relationships to customers and productivity and sales. And then I2 came along and did supply chain management, and then suddenly we had all of these categories of best of breeds and what have you, and this landscape at the bottom became super complicated. We had data in multiple systems suddenly. So then we figured out, okay, with all this data and all of these systems, and we can't get it all consolidated in one, we better consolidate the data on an analytical layer. So SAP bought business objects, and we said, you know, we can connect to any system, SAP and Siebel and what have you, and you know, let you do that, and we'll get analytics out of that, and with that, you'll get consistency again. Well, it turned out not to be enough, and so suddenly there was all these other companies that did analytics, and we did the, you know, the, the data leg, the data storages. In some of these companies where I'm chairing, you know, they look like Finland, the country of a thousand lakes. <laughs> so again, we got this massive complexity with multiple systems, and then we said, oh, we got to move it to the cloud, and, and we began to move it to the cloud, so we took the analytics into the Azure cloud, and then we wanted the CRM, but that's, you know, Salesforce cloud, and, and, and then, you know, Amazon, the AWS is pretty good, and so we did that, and we did cloud in the, in the Google world for some of the analytics around our customers, and then we got complexity again. This is the simplified version of the landscapes at some of your 
companies. It's a very simplified version of the landscapes in the company's eye chair. And of course, it's an inhibitor. Because if you have that and you try and fix that, it's going to take too long. And you go through the pain and you need the therapist because otherwise you're going to be frustrated. So we need to overcome this. Why is this so important? Why does it matter? Well, Tom articulated it really well. Because when you add an intelligent layer to the business that you have, where you have the transactional world, you have your analytical world, you have the clouds, and you add an intelligent layer, and you connect that to the real world of the IoT, magic happens. Transformation happens. Suddenly, you move from the industrial curve to the exponential digital curve. I can give you many, many examples. And I had the pleasure of working with the World Economic Forum where we try to understand what happens in a given industry if you apply this kind of technology. You add intelligence to a given industry at its full potential. They transform dramatically. We could talk about the autonomous vehicle, how that changes everything in automotive, from the business model to the insurance model, you know, to everything that has to do with transportation. Healthcare is a good example as well. And, and, and you know, Watson tried to tackle that. Why? Because it's such a big problem to solve. If you look at our healthcare system today, it is super inefficient. We're basically trying to use generic therapy on patients. We know there's some bad consequences for some patients. And sometimes it works, and most of the cases it does. Maybe it doesn't. We do another therapy. So it's generic therapy on a disease. It is super expensive. Is it 20% of the GDP in the US? You look at an aging population. This problem cannot be solved that way in the future. We just cannot afford it anymore. And then it's super slow. Like, what is FDA approval of a new drug in average 12 years? 12 years. You know, Tom talked about five years. 12 years. We cannot work like that in the future. So when you apply a, an, an intelligent layer to this problem and you begin to get the data from the DNA of the virus or the patient, of course, a lot of things change. Suddenly, you can get accurate analytics. You understand exactly the diagnosis of this patient which means it gets more efficient. You get individual therapy. It's exactly this drug for this patient, because then we know there are no side effects. And of course, you need to have a speed that's faster than 12 months. COVID is a great example of this. The world didn't necessarily get together on how to deal with COVID, but we did start sharing data. And we applied a lot of analytics and a lot of artificial intelligence on top of this problem. And miraculously, we were able to have new test systems. We were able to have vaccines, seven or eight different ones, developed in parallel, different approaches. And we did that in weeks or months, not 12 years. So it is possible. It's almost like the current healthcare system has nothing to do with healthcare. It's disease management, inefficient and too slow. And what we can do if we do this right is that we can have health care where we try and stay healthy. We prevent disease. It's much cheaper and, by the way, much better for human beings. So with that, I believe that this kind of impact will happen in all industries where everything gets better because it's more relevant for the patient, the individual. It gets cheaper because we get more efficient in the system and it gets faster. Imagine what it does to your company and your industry. If you're the first company in your industry to become better, cheaper, and faster, it's kind of a hard combination to beat. That's the opportunity. Now, I am involved in companies where this is happening on a daily basis. We're not necessarily doing it the right approach, but we see the impact of this and we're trying to get our act together. So I'll give you a few examples. Siemens, one of the most important and high value categories we have in our portfolio is our PLM software. With the PLM software, we are able to design a car before the car is actually produced. We're not only able to design it from a beauty point of view, we can actually test drive it. We can drive the car on specific roads in India, in um, 
Delhi. And we can see how many miles will the suspension hold on that road in India. And then we can redesign and redesign. And when we add AI, we can ask the AI to design the suspension in a better way that is more um, sufficient and relevant for that kind of roads and much cheaper to build. Now, before we then build that car, we design the factory to build that car, virtually. And we simulate that factory. We simulate the throughput of that factory. And we optimize the throughput of that factory so that we can build that car in the most efficient possible way. And then we build the factory. We put the robots in the factory, the sensors in the factory, and we add the software to control the robots and get the data from the sensors. And now we add the data from the car we designed virtually and test drove you know, multiple times. And so that factory begins to produce exactly that car. And that car comes out most efficient because we've simulated how to do this. And then we add the sensors in the factory and the sensors in the car. So now we can get the real data from what really happens at the factory floor and what really happens when that car drives in India on those roads. And now we can improve the car and the factory for the next version. Now, this is an example where we apply exactly the technologies that Tom talked about, where you get into the cloud, you get to the data from the sensors, you get to control the robots, and the brain, the intelligence, is what makes the whole difference. It dramatically changes manufacturing. It's going to be cheaper, it's going to be better, and it's going to be faster, much faster. Now, the other example I have is from the energy system. You know, we all know how the energy system needs to transition from a fossil-based energy system to a renewable system, but there's one little problem. When you do that, you get production of electricity when you don't need it. You can't control that. Weather conditions control that. So you might actually get too much electricity at times when you don't need it, or you have no electricity when you actually do need it. And so the only way to solve this problem is, first of all, to add sensors and intelligence to the uh, wind turbines. At, at Siemens Camisa, we put the sensors in. We can see the vibrations from the gearboxes. And with that, we can stop selling the wind turbine and start selling the uptime of the wind turbine and just make sure that it always runs because we can predict with very high likelihood three weeks before a problem happens and send a service uh, mechanic out there to make sure that that problem does not happen. And with that, we are more competitive. And when you put that wind turbine into the energy system, suddenly you need to add intelligence to the energy system so that you can begin to predict supply and demand. You can move demand to times when you have more supply by having dynamic pricing. You need the smart meters so you can understand the consumption and you can change the price on a millisecond basis so that you move demand to where the supply is. Of course, you need also the ability to trans transmit and store that energy, and, and suddenly you have an intelligent energy system. And it's necessary if we want to accelerate into a sustainable future. Again, that system becomes better. It becomes cheaper. And of course, it becomes much faster in our ability to move from a fossil-based fuel system to a renewable system. And I can assure you that with the war going on in Ukraine right now, we are going to accelerate that transition because we might not get access to the fossil fuels we had in the past, at least not in Europe. My last example is from AP Muller Maersk, the largest shipping company in the world. And yes, we can talk about congestions, and I'll get there at the end, but this is about an example of where we are actually applying modern technology to the land transportation, which is the reason why we have congestions, because nobody is picking up the containers at the port of Los Angeles, so there's 80 vessels waiting. And with that, you, you lose capacity in the system because they're just waiting. So we need trucks to offload the port before we can offload the vessels. And therefore, we just invested in these kinds of trucks. 400 trucks from a company called Einride in Sweden. It's a startup. They're actually not producing the trucks, but they're making the software, the intelligent software, to make these trucks autonomous. And most importantly, they are making the software so that you can optimize the network of trucks and make sure that you don't have the empty routes in your network. And on top of that, optimize the charging station network so that you always have the right capacity on your battery for the planned vehicle transportation. Now, you combine these, these uh, problems 
This is a very complicated thing, and without AI, you cannot solve this problem. With AI, you're going to massively transform the transportation industry for trucking. Now, Einride, as I say, they don't produce the trucks. They don't care about the hardware. They produce the intelligence, because that's where the value will be. And with five, 400 trucks now being ordered, this is going to be the first real um, large-scale network of autonomous electric vehicles in the trucking. So again, this means it gets better. It gets cheaper because we optimize the utilization of these assets and it gets much faster. We can now control the end-to-end -end transportation from the farm or the factory to the end consumer because we control the entire network. We can in real time see exactly where everything is. That is the examples that I have to share with you. And you see how everything changes and suddenly the masterpiece is the intelligence and the connectivity to the real world. So, now Tom talked about this. And I have seen this in real, I know this to be true, unfortunately. The question I have to you is, can you afford to wait the five years it takes before you've done all these activities and realize that that approach doesn't work, so let's do the next one? I'm arguing you cannot. You may need to go through these phases, but my plea is you've got to go through them relatively fast. And I wanted to at least give you three recommendations on how potentially to speed up this cycle so you don't have to wait five years to call Tom and say, now we are ready for the real thing. The first recommendation I have is about structure. I believe that we need structures in business that are designed for speed. Now, in the Industrial Revolution, size was the competitive edge. If it's speed now, we need to revisit our organizational structure. When I started at Maersk in 2016, Maersk was eight companies, four of them in the oil industry, four of them in the transportation industry. Maersk today is one laser-focused end-to-end logistics company. We have dismantled the conglomerate, and we have made the transportation the one and only focus of the company, and we are transforming not just the company, but the industry. We just delivered the historic best ever results in 2021. Much, much higher anything, revenue and profits, than the conglomerate with eight different businesses, many of them in oil, in good days of oil. Our profits today are three times higher than that conglomerate. At Siemens, between 2018 and 2020, we basically dismantled the conglomerate and made three Siemenses. The Siemens health engineers laser focused on driving the transformation of healthcare, like we just talked about. The Siemens energy, and Lisa was part of that, thank you, Lisa, of transforming the energy systems so that we bring together the gas turbine business, the wind turbine business, and the intelligent energy distribution system so that we can transform energy systems to be sustainable and affordable. In a separate company, laser focused on exactly that. And then Siemens today focused on the industrial world, the urban areas world, and mobility. Three companies, all of them now growing faster than before. Enormous shareholder value created, 30 billion, just by splitting them. So there is clearly a disadvantage in the conglomerate. Now this means that we're decentralizing. We're making companies more focused so that they can drive the transformation that is going on instead of be too slow, too generic, and then become victims of the change. The second recommendation I have is a recommendation around technology. We have to figure out how to get from the clutter that I was part of creating in your organizations to a different world. There are two approaches to this. The first approach is that you go through the effort of trying to get the messy left side here sorted out. Consolidate the ERP systems, consolidate the CRM systems, consolidate the analytics, make one big lake, not multiple lake in Finland. Good luck. That is going to take at least three years, maybe five years. And I will argue if that you go down that path, you are missing the opportunity because speed matters more today than perfection. My recommendation 
is to get control of the brain. Leave the legacy systems the way they are. You have to find your focus is on this piece. It's almost like the brain of the human being. You have to control the perfection of the brain. So where I suggest decentralization on structure, so people get focused. Here, it's almost like I'm mandating dictatorship. You cannot have a messy brain. You have to have a consistent brain. And most of all, you have to have a brain, a layer for the AI platform, which is productive. And with productivity, I mean, how long does it take for you or anyone else in your organization to build an intelligent application? If it takes months or years, you're already losing. You have to have a platform where you can do that in weeks or months. And that is about productivity of that platform, where people don't spend time on selecting tools and connecting tools. Let a company do that so you get consistency and you get productivity. And then you need openness. So it runs on any cloud. It runs on any other tools as well. But the consistency comes from that platform. Then you have a chance. You be pragmatic. You try and add intelligent layers stepwise. And if you do this right, you connect to the real world. You connect to your current complexity. And it allows you time to begin to consolidate that without losing time on actually delivering high value intelligent applications to your organization at weeks or few months kind of pace. That is my recommendation on that. And the last one is about leadership. And I will end on the leadership. We have, in the industrial age, been working on leadership that looks like this. We translate strategy into business plans. And then we do KPIs to make sure we execute the plan. And then we do business reviews. I know you don't do that, but I've been doing that for many years. Quarterly business reviews, where you look at, are we executing the plan? And I'm asking, what if the plan is wrong? What are we celebrating in the boardroom when we meet our plan? I mean, last year, Maersk changed its guidance four times in the year. We had a plan of 8.5 billion. Uh, 8.5 to 10 billion EBITDA for the year. We ended up at 24. Imagine if we had just delivered the plan. We would have lost, but we would have celebrated. <laughs> that doesn't work anymore because the future is unpredictable. This only works if you can make the perfect plan, but that doesn't exist anymore. I'm arguing a leadership model where you inspire people. You translate strategy into dreams. Dreams that make people have shiny eyes that want to pursue that, the kind of dreams that Tom has built for C3, where people go to work early in the morning because they want to be part of delivering that. And then you don't tell them what to do and stand in their way. You teach them the details that matter the most, and you let human creativity unfold. And you begin to create exponential curves without plans, because people know exactly where they're going, and they have the skills necessary to get there. Why is this important? It is important because that's the way you transform your companies and become digital relevant, where you combine hardware and software in the digital future at the pace necessary. But it's more important than that. It is also important because the future of globalization is at risk. With the war going on in Ukraine, we may have fragmented worlds again. So how will you deal with your supply chains? You need to have more resilient supply chains. And only through resiliency, where you're not single source from one place in China, but you're multi-source from multiple countries, can we create a better future where there's more participation in globalization, there's more participation in global trade, and you get your supply chain not just in time, but just in case. Able to rewire. Now, that is a complex supply chain. And you can only solve that complexity if you add AI to that problem. Secondly, climate is here. It is action. I am tired of people talking about this. And I am so tired of people protesting about this. We need action. We have the technologies today to make a sustainable future. But we can only do that if we add the intelligence layer to those infrastructures and if we are willing to take on leadership and have big dreams about that. I believe this will be your biggest competitive advantage in a few years. Because being sustainable is an opportunity, not a cost. And finally, technology will be the answer to all of this. And I see a, an opportunity, but also a risk. 
that we are not using technology in responsible ways, we begin to kill our democracies because we make echo chambers of people with more and more extreme opinions and we amplify the stupidity in this world and we are not solving the important problems. What we need to do is to use that technology in a responsible way to solve the real problems. This is about the sustainability of the energy systems, the convenience of our transportation systems, and transforming healthcare to be healthcare, not disease management. These are the big opportunities. That's when we hire the talents for the future, because they want to be part of that, not stealing your data and destroying democracy. They want to solve real, real problems that make the world much, much better. I always say that we are lucky to be leaders in time of such dramatic change. But with this luck comes an enormous obligation. An obligation to take on the big problems of this world and solve them. The good news is we have the technologies to do that. The only thing missing is leadership. Leaders who dream big and try and take these problems on and leaders who are willing to spend the time necessary on the details to get us there. I am optimistic when I look at this crowd because you will be using the technologies necessary to do this. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you.